John chapter 20, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So notice, first of all, this happened on the first day of the week. The Sabbath was over, and at the first light of the day after Sabbath, Mary Magdalene was there. The other Gospels tell us that this was at the very, very beginning when it was still dark outside. You know that that, that moment of darkness before the dawn begins? That's when they set out on this thing. And it wasn't only Mary Magdalene, but it was a couple other people. But John, like a laser beam, is stripping away everything else and putting his entire focus on the most essential things in the resurrection story. So John only tells us about one woman, Mary Magdalene, who was among a few other women who came there. Now, one thing you should think about when it comes to Mary Magdalene, we're not told much about her. We know where she came from. Her name tells us that she came from the village of Magdala, which is right on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so we know that much. The other thing that the Bible tells us about Mary Magdalene, it tells us it in two places, and the place I'll quote to you is found in Mark chapter 16, verse 9. The Bible tells us that Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. It says he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Now, that's kind of a terrible description to have of yourself in the Scriptures. Hi, I'm the one of whom Jesus cast out seven demons. But at the same time, isn't that a pretty glorious description? I used to be bound by seven demons, not one, not three, not five, seven, Mary Magdalene would say, and Jesus delivered me from those. And friends, I wonder if that didn't play a special role in Mary Magdalene's devotion right here. I wonder if it didn't cross her mind. Now that Jesus is dead, what's going to happen to me? Are those demons going to come back? A living Jesus cast those demons out of me. Now that he's gone, are they going to come back to me? But she was pushing all those thoughts in behind, and she had no expectation that Jesus would rise from the dead. She came to the tomb fully expecting to find the dead body of Jesus that she would do additional preparations for when it came to the burial. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they did the best that they could in the time that they had, but in some measure, they must have felt that their job was incomplete, and so it was left to Mary and these few other women to complete the, tomb, the work. So Mary comes up to the tomb, and what does she see? She sees that the stone is rolled away, that it's gone, that the tomb is open. I want you to understand, her first reaction is not, he's risen. His first reac- her first reaction is, somebody stole that body. Don't you think that's remarkable? Now, the reason why I point this out, and I'll be pointing this out through the message because it's all throughout the text. People who want to say that the resurrection of Jesus didn't really happen, one of the things they try to do to to, to say, well, then why is it that everybody said they saw him alive? They say it was just some kind of psychological wish projection. They really, really wished he was alive, so they talked themselves into believing that he was alive. Now, I don't think that holds any weight, but what I want you to understand is Mary Magdalene had no anticipation that that he would be alive. She fully expected to find a dead body within that tomb. But in verse 2, when she finds out that the dead body is not the tomb, they said they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. That was the message that she ran back and gave to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. We know that in the Gospel of John to be John himself. So John and Peter hear the news from Mary Magdalene, not that Jesus is risen, but that the tomb is open and we don't know what has happened to the body. Got that? Now verse 3. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. You'll notice this. The news hit John and Peter that the tomb was empty and the stone was rolled away. What was their reaction? Wow, that's really interesting. Somebody's got to look into that. Maybe we should call the authorities. Are you kidding? 
They had such an investment in the life and in the person of Jesus that they knew we have to investigate this for ourselves. And so without any hesitation, they ran. They sprinted from wherever they were they staying in the, in the city of Jerusalem to the garden tomb where they knew Jesus was buried. They ran all the way, Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which we know to be John. Can I point out something here from verse 4 where it says there, they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Notice this. John is humble enough to not name himself. He's proud enough to let you know, yeah, I outran the old man. We don't know for sure, of course, but most Christian traditions believe that John was younger than Peter by maybe 10 or 15, or some people even speculate 20 years. And he goes, yeah, I, I, just, I got there first. I came to it first. I get that. Now notice, John came to the tomb first, and what did he do? Did he wait for Peter to catch up to him? No. Look at verse 5. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. And then it says, um, Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by, himself, by itself. Then the other disciples, disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So notice with verse 5, the first thing that happens is that John arrives to the tomb. And what does he do? He stoops down and he looks in. Now, please understand what we're talking about with an ancient tomb. And by the way, this was a tomb of a rich man. It wasn't the tomb of a working man. This was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea which wasn't just a tomb for an individual, but for a family in a typical way. So what you would do is you would walk into a thing and there would be an open area there. And then off to a side, there would be a larger area with sort of a platform carved into the rock where you could lay out a couple of bodies. And I say a couple of bodies because it was common in these family tombs that there might be more than one body in there at a time. They would wait for the bodies to decompose. Once the bodies had decomposed enough, they would put the bones or the remains in boxes or in containers, and they would keep them in the tomb and have it available for the next family member that died. This was just the common way that they did it. So when John runs up to the tomb, he looks inside, and what does he see? Notice it. He examines it. The ancient word used there means to clearly see a material object. He stoops down and he looks in and he sees the grave wrappings of Jesus still in the tomb. He clearly saw this, but something told John, don't go in. I'm not going to go in. I'm not going to go in. I wonder why. I could give you a guess. It's nothing more than a guess. This is one of the things that you'll have to ask John when you get to heaven and have a little time with him. But I think he didn't go in because he wondered if the body of Jesus was not still in the tomb. Maybe some terrible enemy of Jesus came in and removed the grave clothes and dumped the body in there. Maybe somebody had done something horrible and desecrating to the body of Jesus Maybe the Romans who saw a threat, maybe the religious leaders, maybe those thoughts are filling the mind of John. And he goes, whoa, if the body's still in there, and especially if it's unwrapped and it's just kind of there and, and exposed and all that, I don't want any part of it. John doesn't go in. He stays back. He clearly sees the grave clothes, but he doesn't go in. That's not going to stop Peter at all. Look at it here, verse 6. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. Can you picture that? Peter comes huffing and puffing, the older man. His face is red. There's sweat all over. He comes in, and when he sees that John is backed away from the entrance, boom, Peter goes right in. That's Peter. Impulsive Peter. Nothing's going to hold him back. Nothing's going to stop him. And what does he see? Verse 6, he saw the linen cloths lying there. Going in, Peter saw... And again, I don't want this to be a lesson in the ancient biblical languages, 
But the specific word that's translated saw there means to contemplate, to observe, to scrutinize. Peter looked at what was in that tomb with a very critical eye, and he saw this is different. There's something different about these grave clothes. They are arranged in a curious and a significant way. They are orderly. They are lying there as if the body simply evaporated out of the grave clothes. Now, it speaks about it in two pieces. The wrappings, and in those days, commonly, they would wrap a body from the neck down, something like a mummy, excuse me, <coughs> although they wouldn't pass the process of mummification. But then secondly, they would put something over the head, <coughs> like a separate turban or wrappings for the head. You see, <coughs> I knew this was going to happen. <coughs> <coughs> I knew that I would find myself too excited and not holding back my voice, and that I just have to get through this for a little bit. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take out a second cough drop and put it in my mouth. <laughs> and the reason why I give warning to that is for the people in the first few rows, it is always possible <laughs> that it could come flying out of my mouth. <laughs> and so I give you fair warning ahead of time. They saw the grave clothes arranged both with the body wrappings and the head wrapping as if the body had just evaporated out of it. Now, friends, you've got to admit, if you saw that with your own eyes, you go, this is weird. This cannot be the work of grave robbers. This could not be the work of friends. This could not be the work of enemies. Something supernatural has happened here. The linen cloths were there... The body had not been removed with the linen cloths. The linen cloths were orderly, and then the linen cloths were not removed by any grave robbers or vandals. That's what Peter saw, and it blew his mind. Now look at what happens with verse 8. It says, the other disciple went in also, and he saw and believed. After Peter went in, then John went, John went in, and he saw, now again, we come into a third ancient Greek word for looking, for seeing. This particular ancient Greek word has the idea to understand. The first Greek word for saw just means to look at something. The second one means to see and carefully examine. This third one means to understand and to perceive the significance of. When John came in, he went a step further. Further than Peter, he looked at the arrangement of the grave clothes, and what does it say? It says there, verse 8, he saw also and he believed. The distinctive arrangement of the burial wrappings convinced John he's risen from the dead. And as far as we know, John was the first human being to understand Jesus Christ is risen. Not just that the body's gone, not just that the grave is empty, but that Jesus Christ is risen. By the way, isn't it interesting here that John wants to let us know that not only was he first in the foot race, he was also first in the faith race, right? He, he was first on both accounts, that he beat Peter to the punch. But would you please notice this, the significance of it? It says in verse 9, for as of yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. In other words, John perceived that Jesus was risen from the dead not by seeing the risen Jesus. That's how most people came to faith in the resurrected Jesus. How did the hundreds of the earliest Christians believe that Jesus was really risen from the dead? They saw the resurrected Jesus. Matter of fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians, it says that hundreds at a time Jesus appeared to his early believers. Hundreds at a time. How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? Um, I saw him. I talked to him. I know it's the same Jesus. He was risen from the dead. And then they took it from the reliable testimony of those who had seen the risen Jesus. John is a little bit different. Before he ever met the resurrected Jesus, 
he could deduce it from the condition of the tomb and the grave wrappings. He believed, but notice this. It says that they didn't understand how it connected with the scriptures yet. Here's the idea. John understood the fact of the resurrection before he understood the meaning of the resurrection. There are two separate ideas there, are there? aren't there? The fact of the resurrection, the meaning of the resurrection. And the first thing I want to tell you is, friends, I want you to be persuaded of the fact of the resurrection. And I could go on and on and speak about this, how the rules of evidence, how the historical framework, how all of it fits together, that we can know that as much as anything happened in history, we can know that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And you know what? He's risen from the dead, whether or not you believe it. It's not just, well, I believe he rose from the dead. Okay, he did. I don't believe he rose from the dead. Maybe he didn't. No. It's just like if you were to take any uh, event in history. It happened whether or not you believe it or not. Sometimes there's a song we like to sing as Christians. or You know, it's an old song. You can think of somebody playing it, leading on the piano. Um, he lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives in me. He walks with me and talks with me along life's way. And then goes, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives inside my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, whether or not he lives inside your heart, he lives. He lives independently of you. He live. Now, I hope he lives inside your heart. And it's extremely important as it hits you personally. But we're not just talking about a subjective idea. We're talking about something that is established as a historical fact. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That's the fact of the resurrection. Now I want you to think about it in terms of another thing. What does it mean? Just because something happened, I got to watch my voice here. You see, I'm getting wound up again already. (laughs) Just because something happened doesn't mean that it is rich with meaning. But the resurrection, it means everything. I'll tell you the first thing that it means. It means that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. He's God. Isn't that an amazing thing for us to say about a man who walked this earth? He is God. Jesus claimed to be God. And you know what? If you can raise from the dead, you, you got pretty good credentials to do that. And I'm not just talking about being resuscitated in an ER ward, although God bless anything that happens like that. I'm talking about rising from the dead never to die again. I'm talking about rising in a new order of life. That's resurrection power. That's what Jesus did. And it proves that everything Jesus said about himself is true. That's one thing that the resurrection means. Another thing that the resurrection means, if Jesus rose from the dead then his people can be sure of their resurrection. The Bible tells us that the resurrection of Jesus is like a first fruits, a preview, step one in the resurrection of his people. We can be assured that if Jesus rose from the dead, then those who trust in him will rise from the dead, and we do not need to fear death. We don't. This hits us kind of precious right now, doesn't it? And our own congregation, we've had some dear ones depart from us in the last weeks, in the last months. And we think about it, don't we? We think about it with sorrow for their families. We think about it with sorrow for us. But let me tell you, we, we think about it with a little bit of jealousy for the person who's gone on and going to be with Jesus. There, with Jesus. I'm not there yet. Jesus, see me through to the end just as faithfully as you saw that dear brother or sister through to the end. Because our resurrection is assured. When I do a funeral, especially if I do it at a graveside, there's a little portion that I like to quote from the Anglican Book of Prayer that I think is a beautiful thing, a beautiful thought at the graveside. And this is how it goes. It says this, We commit the body of our brother or sister unto this ground, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection. I can't say those words without getting a little bit choked up. In sure and certain hope of the resurrection. This is our legacy. This is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for his people. We have a sure and certain hope. There's another thing that the resurrection means. It means that God has an eternal plan 
for these bodies that he created. It means that God's salvation is not only interested in my soul or my spirit, but that he has a plan of redemption that extends to the spirit, the soul, and the body, the complete person. And I don't know what our resurrection bodies are going to look like in heaven, but they will have some connection to these physical bodies that we have now. I don't know how God's going to do it. Maybe he'll take one molecule of your DNA and from that bring forth something glorious. I hope it will be glorious. I hope it's just like we are now, except new and improved. I wonder what ideal age we'll be at in heaven. Who knows? I know one guy suggests this. He said, well, the kingdom of God belongs to little children. We'll all be like 10-year-olds in heaven. Which is a fun thought, isn't it? I don't know if it's true, but we will be there. Our body in heaven will have a connection to the body that we have here right now. I can tell you something else that the resurrection means. The resurrection means that God demonstrates his power in an ultimate sense. Do you realize that? The Bible tells us that the cross of Jesus Christ, the death he died on the cross, that that is the ultimate demonstration of the love of God. You cannot find a greater demonstration of the love of God than what Jesus did on the cross. The greatest demonstration of the power of God, it's what Jesus did in raising from the dead. The empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus, that is the ultimate display of power. And aren't you happy that the God who loves you so much has the power to do great things in your life? It's not enough just to have the love or the power. God has both the love and the power, and he wants to make it real in our lives. And then finally, I'll say this about the meaning of the resurrection, even though I could go on and on. I'll cut the list short. Finally, the meaning of the resurrection, it tells us that the payment that Jesus offered on the cross was accepted by the Father. Let me express it to you this way. Do we understand that our sins were paid for on the cross. Matter of fact, what did Jesus cry out with his last breath before he yielded his spirit unto God on the cross? With his last breath, Jesus cried out, to tell us die, paid in full. It's translated, it is finished in your Bible, but it means paid in full. Now, it's one thing for the person who owes the debt to cry out or is making the payment to cry out, uh, it is finished. It's another thing for the person who's receiving the payment to say it is finished. And what God says is the empty tomb is the evidence that the payment was received. How about this? Use this image. The cross is the payment. The empty tomb is the receipt. And you can take that receipt and shake it in the devil's face. Listen. That cross paid for what what, um, my sins, what Jesus sacrificed on the cross was more than enough to cover my sins. But listen, not only do I shake the payment in your face, devil, I'm going to shake the receipt in your face. The cross demonstrates the payment. The empty tomb demonstrates that the payment was received and it is the receipt. Well, as I said before, we could go on and on about what the meaning of the resurrection is, but understand... John, to this point, understood the fact of the resurrection, but because they did not yet understand the scriptures, they did not understand the meaning of the resurrection. That would come to them at a later time. Now, verse 11. We come back to Mary Magdalene. John and Peter checked out the tomb. They went home or back to their place. Who do they leave behind? Poor old Mary Magdalene. Look at it here in verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one on the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have lain lain him. Now notice this. Peter and John, there's a poor weeping woman outside the tomb. Yeah, Mary, see ya. We got to get on our way. You think they would have hung out and kind of comforted Mary for a few minutes? They had other things on their mind. They left. Mary's there bawling her eyes out. John believed, but he didn't say anything about it to Peter or to Mary. He just left. He kept it within himself. John and Peter leave. Mary is left alone there weeping, and she goes, 
Those guys looked in. I guess I can look in too. She goes inside the tomb. And friends, who knows how much time had elapsed from the time that Peter and John left the tomb to the time that Mary went in. Who knows, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes? We don't know. It couldn't have been long. But in that gap of time, what had happened? Two angels were sitting there in the room. They're just sitting there. John and Peter make no mention of the angels, which you think they would have. You think they would have noticed if the two angels were there. Now, two angels are in the room. Mary sees nothing about the grave clothes or the wrappings, even though they're there. She just sees two angels. And you know what is absolutely mind-blowing about this, where it says in verse 12, she saw two angels in white sitting? What's too amazing about this is that she didn't even seem to care. Look, you, you guys are familiar with the Bible. So often in the Bible, when angels appear, what are the first two words they say? Don't be afraid. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Why do they say that? Because people are terrified when they see angels. What does Mary see? She sees two angels sitting there in a close room, close proximity. doesn't even bother her. She is so seeking after Jesus that angels can't satisfy her. You know, angels, no offense, I don't care. Where's Jesus? Angels, uh, angel one, angel two, I, I don't mean to offend you. You don't impress me at all. I'm looking for Jesus. D don't we need more of the spirit of Mary Magdalene in our churches today? Doesn't the Christian world as a whole need to have more of that attitude of, look, yeah, I know that there's this strange or spectacular things going on there. Yeah, whatever. Angels, you're in the tomb. Great. Where's Jesus? I want Jesus. Show unto me Jesus. You, you angel presence here, it doesn't mean anything to me if Jesus is not present. I'm looking for him. I want him to fill my life. So she saw these two angels, but she's not impressed at all. And they say, what's going on? She says, listen, they've taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid them. She wasn't thinking. She wasn't even dreaming that Jesus was alive. Now come to verse 14. I've got to watch my voice here. I see I'm getting wound up all over again. Verse 14, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Now, do you see what it says, first of all, there in verse 14? It says, when she had said this, she turned around. So apparently, at least a little bit, she's backing out of the tomb. Oh, angels, yeah, so what? Where's Jesus? He's not in here. I'm not interested. She's backing out of the tomb. And some people, some ancient commentators believe that the angels actually motioned to Mary, turn around, there's somebody behind you. Look behind you. You know, which could have been? Maybe the angels say, hey, you, you want to know where Jesus is? Look, look around, turn around. Mary turns around, and what does she see behind? She sees a man standing right there. And do you see what it says there, verse 14? She did not know that it was Jesus. Now, let me make two points from this. One of them very just sort of biblical knowledge point. Another one full of personal application. The sort of biblical knowledge point is this. It's fascinating that many people saw the resurrected Jesus and did not instantly recognize him. On the road to Emmaus, they saw Jesus resurrect. They didn't instantly recognize. Other instances, they see Jesus. They don't immediately understand it's him. Why? I can't tell you I know for sure. Some people believe that it's sort of a spiritual blinding in the eyes. That's possible. Other people believe that Jesus still carried something of the disfigurement that he suffered in his uh, passion and in his crucifixion. And friends, that could be. We know that he retained the pierced hand or wrist. We know that he maintained the cut in his side from where the spear went through. Maybe his face looked somewhat disfigured from the beating that he had taken. Now, when I say that, that upsets some people. They're like, no, wait, wait, wait. When I get to heaven and I see Jesus, I don't want to see a Jesus disfigured a little bit. I, I want to see the beautiful Jesus. Let me tell you, the Jesus you see in heaven is going to be the beautiful Jesus. And 
if he is disfigured in any way, it will only add to his beauty because you will know that he suffered that out of love for you. It will be a trophy of his love, a display of his grace. But that's possible that Jesus looked a little bit different bearing these marks of his suffering. That's one thing. The other thing I want you to understand, isn't it fascinating that it is possible for a person to be right in the presence of the resurrected Jesus and not know it? That could be you. It could be you here this morning. You're around all these other people and you feel, well, the worship, they seem to be into it. The person next to me was really singing. I don't really get it. This guy's going on about the Bible as if it really happened. I mean, really? I mean, come on. And you could be sitting right next to somebody for whom the resurrected Jesus is completely real and they experience him and you don't. And here's the thing. You want to say that it's not real because you don't experience it. Don't you see the Bible's telling you that you can be right next to the resurrected Jesus and for some reason have yourself blinded to the fact that he's there? No, let that wash away from you, friends. Realize that Jesus wants to reach out to you. Now, look at what Jesus does. I wonder if he's messing a little bit with Mary's head because he doesn't immediately say, hey, Mary, don't worry about it. I'm Jesus. Verse 15, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Come on, what are you looking for? Why are you crying? Tell me what's on your heart. And then God bless Mary Magdalene. God bless this woman who owed so much to Jesus because he had cast seven demons out of her. God bless this woman because she says in verse 15, look, you just tell me where you laid him and I'll pick him up and carry him off. Now, listen, I I don't know. Maybe Mary of Magdalene really was a large, strong woman. You know, maybe she was just a beefy gal. I don't know. We kind of imagine her being just like a normal woman who would have a hard time picking up a dead body, especially if it had a hundred pounds of spices and ointments on it, and carrying it. But Mary is not even thinking about, she's not even thinking about the load or the weight of Jesus. I'll carry him away. I'll pick him up. You just tell me where he is and I'll do it. She's, She's just so seeking after Jesus. She's so in love with Jesus, even though she completely believes that he's dead, that she just simply says, you tell me where he is and I'll go and pick her up, pick him up, I mean. Now verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, one word, one word, Mary, and it changed everything. I think that was probably the most powerful one word sermon ever preached. Mary, the tone of his voice, the way he said it, spiritual recognition, who knows all that was involved there. But when he said Mary, the light went on and she realized this is Jesus and he is risen from the dead. And Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons, she had the privilege of being the first person on the face of the earth to meet the resurrected Jesus. She wasn't the first person to believe that Jesus risen from the dead, that was John. But the first person to actually meet the resurrected Jesus Mary Magdalene. Now, friends, if you were going to pick someone to be the very first person to receive that, wouldn't you pick a better witness than Mary? Uh, Would you tell us about your past, ma'am? Well, I did have seven demons in me. How do you know it's not one of those demons right now that has told you, Jesus, listen, I know he's risen from the dead. I met him. I experienced him. He called my name. Now, listen. If you need to meet the resurrected Jesus here this morning, if all this seems very distant to you and it's like, yeah, this is what the other people believe in, listen, I'm really glad you're here, but let me just challenge you with this. Would you just pray a simple prayer? You just pray this. Jesus, if you're there, I don't mind if you pray that. Jesus, if you're there, if you're truly risen from the dead, would you call to me as you called to Mary? And I don't know how he'll answer that prayer. I doubt that he'll audibly say your name or physically appear before you, but in some way, Jesus will reveal to you that he is risen from the dead and that he's real. Just ask him to prove yourself to him. And you wait. You will see Jesus do that. You will see that what the scriptures say is entirely true, that Jesus Christ is indeed risen from the dead because the resurrected Jesus is not done revealing himself to people. He still does it to this very day. That's the first thing. The second thing, look at it here in verse 17. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, 
For I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to me, to her. Now notice at first in verse 17, Jesus had to tell Mary, do not cling to me. Some people have gotten the wrong idea from this, mostly from the older King James translation where it says, touch me not, Mary. And the idea is somehow that the touch of Mary might defile Jesus. Don't touch me, Mary. Don't touch me. I've got to ascend to my Father. Well, we know that this isn't true because as we're going to see in the coming weeks as we get into the Gospel of John, Jesus appears before Thomas and says, go ahead, touch me. Stick, stick the finger at me and touch me. It's not like Jesus couldn't be touched. No, it comes from understanding a better translation of this. It's not touch me not. It's stop clinging to me, Mary. Look, it's not hard to figure out what happened. Jesus reveals himself to Mary. Mary. She says, Rabboni. And what does she do? She grabs on to Jesus with a bear hug that will not let go. And she's holding on to him so tight that I believe, and look, I can't prove it, but I think he said this with a laugh. Let go of me, Mary. You can't keep me down here on earth forever. I do have to ascend to my father eventually. But her heart is like this. I lost you once. I am never, ever going to lose you again. I am not letting go of you. And Jesus says, do not cling to me. Stop clinging to me. Let me go, Mary, is essentially what he said. Now, the first thing he said, Mary, you don't have to worry. I am resurrected. I'm filled with power. Those seven demons are never coming back to you. I am the resurrected Savior, and I have triumphed over all those things. But the next thing he says, look at it in verse 17, you go to my brethren and say to them. Not only was Mary the first one to see the resurrected Jesus, she was the first one to be a messenger of the resurrection. Even though in those days, a woman's testimony wasn't accepted in a court of law. Even though I think it would be a further mark against her character that at one time she had been possessed with seven demons. Jesus didn't care. Mary, you're so special. You are going to be the messenger of my resurrection. Go to my brethren and tell them. Two things from this, and we can close with this. First of all, please notice, whatever your past it doesn't disqualify you from Jesus Christ working his redemption and using you in a precious way. Look, I, I don't know. You, some of you probably no doubt got a checkered past. Let's just put you in the Mary Magdalene category. Even if you had been possessed with seven demons in the past, the power of Jesus to work his redemption and to set you free and to make you not only a privileged person to meet the resurrected Jesus, but also a privileged messenger of his, that's God's invitation to you today. That's the one thing. Take hope in that. But the second thing, look at it there in verse 17. What did Jesus tell Mary to do? Go to who? My brethren. Now, oftentimes I read the Bible and I'm very thankful that I'm not Jesus. Because if I were Jesus, it would have gone something like this. Go tell those weasels who all forsook me at the cross and every one of them that wouldn't stick up for me and fled like cowards, go tell those guys that I'm alive and I'm looking for them. <laughs> Let's thank the Lord that the resurrected Jesus has his own glory, his own grace. And he says, Mary, you go tell my brethren and tell them that I'm raised from the dead. My brethren... I love them. They're in my family. They're my brothers. Yeah, I, I know I used to call them my disciples, but now they're more than disciples. They're my brothers. We're together in one family. And don't you see that the resurrected Jesus invites you today into his family? Come, you can be one of my brethren. Oh no, you don't know all the ways that I've let Jesus down. Who cares? He invites you today. You come in. You can hear that from Jesus. You go and tell my brethren that I'm risen from the dead. Well, I, I regret. we got to end it here. Next week, we're going to continue on. But haven't we seen enough this morning just to make us rejoice in the resurrected Savior? He is risen. He is risen indeed. And let's pray. Father, 
Lord, I pray for every person here that no matter the greatness of the affliction that they've suffered, suffered, Lord, I don't care if they've been possessed by 10 demons in the past. The resurrected Jesus has a power greater than all of that. And they never have to be bound again. Lord, I, I don't care if people have turned their back on Jesus or betrayed him or forsaken him in some way. Your power, your greatness, your glory in the power of your resurrection, in the evidence of your new life, it's greater than all of that. So Jesus, now, won't you come and fill us with your hope, fill us with your power, fill us with the goodness of knowing that you are our resurrected Savior. We thank you for it together, Lord, here collectively. We bring it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.